welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast, a podcast about stage musicals that have been legally filmed and publicly distributed. The Filmed Live Musicals website contains information on nearly 200 musicals that have been captured live. Check it out at filmedlivemusicals.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Filmed Live Musicals podcast. I'm your host, Louisa Lyons, and my guest today is Brandon Powers, a choreographer, director, and producer whose work focuses on capturing liveness in the digital. In the virtual world, Brandon has choreographed AI work, which has been seen at the Venice International Film Festival, Tribeca Film Festival, Keynes AR, and Sundance. He's the associate producer at the New York Musical Theatre Factory and founder of Fifth Wall Forum, which boosts artists and projects in the film live performance XR narrative space. On stage, Brandon has created work at La Mama, Here, Ars Nova, and Performance Space New York, and worked with Andy Blankenbuehler on the Broadway musical Bandstand, which was filmed live at the Bernie B. Jacobs Theatre in 2017. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. My pleasure. So to start us off with, what made you fall in love with musical theater? Sure. I think for me, you know, I had the privilege of both A, growing up in New York City um, and having really ease of locational access to Broadway and a lot of amazing musical theater and a family who were really big supporters of the arts and were really passionate about exposing us to all forms of art and especially live performance and I'm a classic case of, you know, younger brother syndrome, where my older sister was um, really into theater. And I actually wasn't, I was, you know, we would go to stuff, but it wasn't like my thing until a few different intersections with dance really is where it was kind of starting, where uh, first the National Dance Institute came to my elementary school and had a program with us. And they offered me a scholarship to join their dance school. And I turned it down because I said, I don't want to dance. I want to play baseball. What are you talking about? <laughs> and my mom like tried to like, even like bribe me into going and I like wouldn't go. And then the next year, luckily, we had another school. Well, actually, I'm flipping back and forth. First, it was the Harkness Dance Center and it was ballet in fourth grade. And then in fifth grade, the National Dance Institute came and they also offered me a scholarship and I really loved that. And I just fell in love with the way NDI uh, communicates around dance. They have an extremely accessible way of teaching it to young kids and exploring it with them. And I was hooked and I kind of went on from there and started to dance with actually at funny enough back at the Harkness Center is where I then continued my dance training. Um, <laughs> after I got that little introduction with a different b mindset, not in ballet, because I, I never really returned to a deep training in ballet, but I entered through uh, hip hop and jazz, which became classical, modern and contemporary. And as that continued on, that blended together with theater. Um, and I went to theater camp as a kid, as many of us do. And that's where the musical theater really started to kick in. And Which theater camp did you go there. to? I went to French Woods. Oh, yes, one of the most well-known. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we were. I was only there for a few years. I'm not one of those lifer 15-year French Woods kids, but uh, <laughs> I had a really great time there. And it's a lot of fun to see people in the community now who are colleagues and coworkers who I was in a you know production of Pirates of Penzance in you know together when we were like 11, and now we're like both working on like professional shows. So that's pretty fun. <laughs> Oh, that's glorious. I love that. And I love that uh, the first school that tapped you, that you ended up going back there, it was like it was meant to be yes. that you, you were meant to it, study there. It was ultimately meant to be. I just needed to enter through a different door and it just needed to yeah. not be ballet. It needed to be hip hop. Um, but I always really um, pride myself on being you know, a product of strong public arts education um, in public schools. And, you know, so part of my world is also being a teaching artist because I really love being able to now go to schools with elementary school, with high school kids and show them, especially young boys, that dance can be possible for them, especially because dance is such a new, deeper part of our culture for boys. So it's great to be there with them. And that there are alternatives to baseball. Yes, there are alternatives to baseball. <laughs> I still love baseball. I take it very seriously. I just realized I shouldn't play it. I should just watch it. <laughs> I'm curious, are your parents artists too? 
my parents are not professional artists. They, you know, my dad always likes to say that, you know, like, oh yeah, he was in like a chorus when he was younger and that's what rubbed off on my sister and then me, but they are not. They just are really passionate about it and love going to shows and they love visual art as well. And so they just, through New York, you know, made it a really important priority for us to all as a family, you know, enjoy that work. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. And how great to grow up in that environment and especially in New York City. You talked about public education with public television. Lots of musicals have been filmed and made available on TV. I I know you grew up in New York, so it was like in your backyard. But did you watch theater on TV growing up? Sure. Yeah, I feel like a big impact was definitely that classic Into the Woods DVD. I think it was a big part of my high school experience because we we did Into the Woods and I loved being able to watch it there. Um, a lot of PBS, um, you know, a lot of actually like Gilbert and Sullivan, Pirates of Penzance um, performance, um, really loved all of those um, and wanted to absorb as much as that as I could. I think I was very excited by the level of spectacle in a lot of those early, you know, late, late nineties television experiences. Um, and so that really, you know, got me excited about it. Mm. And then going into university, what did you decide to study? So I, yeah, so I went to Northwestern uh, university and I went to Northwestern knowing that I wanted to be a director choreographer. And that was one of the main reasons why, I chose to go there because I knew I'd be able to study both because it can actually be pretty challenging to be able to study theater and dance in a deep way, which seems pretty odd because they're intrinsically linked, but so many universities ask you to choose which direction um, you want to like deeply focus on. And I knew I could essentially double major there and also focus on directing and choreography because they had really amazing faculty teaching that to undergrads, which is pretty special usually you have to wait till you're a graduate student there. And so I was able to really tackle that through a lot of amazing collaborations with the department at Northwestern, as well as the extremely robust uh, student theater scene that's there, which is known as the Student Theater Coalition or STUCO for short, which would pr produce uh, about like 80 different student uh, produced, directed, and performed everything uh shows every year and there were like 13 different essentially student theater companies that would professionally put together all of these productions and make them happen and decide on them and i was a uh on one of those boards um, as they were called starting from my second month at school for the rest of the four years and i ended up actually being the co-chair of all of stuco in senior year so that was an amazing experience in just learning how to make shit uh, which I think is really important for young artists and something that I always love to talk about to other young artists, especially on TikTok, is encourage them to just go out there and make stuff. And Northwestern is a really special place, especially in that era where we really got to create. What was it that drew you to choreographing and directing? So for me, it was this combination actually of the artistic experience, which I was, you know, falling in love with dance and with theater, but also was really excited by uh, like student government. Um, and it was like, I want to be the head of a big company or I want to be the president. And I was like reading books about <laughs> all of those things. Um, and I realized I can wait, I can kind of do both. <laughs> um, and that was at least my early conception of what directing could be. Uh, and begin to create uh, with other people and that collaboration because I knew I loved being a leader and leading rooms and having conversations with people. And fortunately, when I was in middle school as a part of this uh, hip hop group, and then especially in my high school experience, the theater program and dance program where I went was actually really focused in directing and choreography. And they gave us a lot of opportunities to do both. And we were really making and learning about dance by making our own movement. And I just started to express myself with movement. Um, and the, the biggest inspiration for me was uh, reading New York Times articles and, and seeing photos and wanting to turn them into dances. Um, and if you do 
a deep dive on YouTube, you will actually find my first ever choreographed dance from me in high school. Um, so good luck to anyone who wants to go and listen to uh, watch that. It's it's pretty funny um, <laughs> and, and fun to revisit because I'm like, I am exactly the same in so many ways. Uh, and I see myself <laughs> from there. Um, and, and then directing came as along that journey as well. And, um, and then I saw, and I fell in love with a lot of different choreographers, and then I saw Next to Normal on Broadway. And mm -hmm. I was just so impacted by directing in such a deep way of that show, directed by Michael Greif. And I was like, that's the moment I remember in my life being like, this is what I want to do. I want to direct Broadway musicals. I want to create stage pictures like he created on in that house set. Um, and Michael went to Northwestern. And so I was like, I want to go to Northwestern. Uh, and, uh, and luckily it happened. Oh, I love that. I was, it's funny. I was expecting you to pick, be kind of like, you know, like Fosse or Michael Bennett, like that, you know, the traditional director choreographers, but I, I love that you came to it from a kind of a different, um, a different angle, which is really cool. Sure. Yeah. My, my true original choreographer love in high school um, was Paul Taylor. And he's really so much of the reason why I dance. And for folks who don't know, he's a um, really popular, well-known, like father of American modern dance. Um, and his movement was very masculine. Um, he had kind of a dark way of expressing um, ideas through dance and it just helped me feel like I could fit in in what I was trying to do and I got to be a part of uh, our, our my high school has members from professional dance companies come and set pieces on us and someone from Paul Taylor happened to be who they chose for that year while I was there and so to have that intimate experience with members of their company was so special and really you know, having this older male dancer be like this, you can do this. Like we believe in you was really impactful. Um, and so he was kind of that rock for me. And then it grew into um, choreographers like uh, Stephen Hoggett, who in high school really changed my life. Um, choreographer mm -hmm. of Once, an American Idiot, um, and uh, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, um, as well as... Um, Andy Blankenbuehler, who I then ultimately got to work with, which was amazing, and Peter Darling, uh, original card for Matilda, Billy Elliot. Those were some of the folks that made me begin to understand my, my own movement language. Oh, such a broad range of uh, influences there. And I love the kind of, when you were talking earlier about the kind of dark, telling dark stories, um, and like Next to Normal Again comes to mind, like how how that was also a very impactful musical for me and one that I wish desperately was filmed at live and made available. Oh, um, I know it's yes. in the archives, but I, I, it's just, it was such a glorious musical. And I love this idea of storytelling through dance and how like all the shows that you just mentioned, how important dance is to those musicals. And yeah, that you get me all excited, <laughs> especially when it comes to. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Yes, I Absolutely. love Matilda so much. I just, there's, I'm always crying about Matilda. That's impossible to not cry. And then even the movie, I was just like instantly crying. And, but <laughs> as you kind of pointed out, right, it was, it was beginning to see how the, the directing and the choreography could really be interwoven and brought together mm -hmm. and how it could become a really deep entrenched form of storytelling. And that's something that really seeing, um, uh, Stephen Hoggett's work and Michael Mayer's work on American Idiot actually was the show that I always say changed my life because I was at a summer theater program called um, Powerhouse, which is over at Vassar. And it's an amazing program because not only are you doing your own intensive training, but then there's a professional shows that are happening as a part of the Powerhouse New York uh, stage and film season. And they opened those rehearsal rooms to the apprentices. And so I got to be in the first ever rehearsals for American Idiot before it went to Berkeley even. And I was just watching them stage it, even like it was the first time Green Day ever saw the show. I was like sitting next to Green Day as they like showed it to them. I'm in the documentary. It's pretty crazy. Like in the back, <laughs> like with the coffee. Um, and uh, that's where I was able to watch 
Mayer and Hoggett like co-create something that I feel like I had never seen before. I will ride with American Idiot forever um, mm -hmm. and be welcomed in that room as a high schooler and say like, oh, like this is what directing a musical is and how that's different from directing a play, which maybe I got to do as a, you know, in high school. And this is the way that direct choreographing a musical can look so different and we can train all these people to be amazing movers, even though none of them are like quote unquote dancers. They're really, we're mm. all just like awesome actors. And Steven was putting them through boot camp of just like workouts. Uh, and that you can see that influence on my work to this day. I kind of do the, the same warm ups I learned when I was there. Oh, wow. What a cool experience to be able to have in high school. Yes, absolutely. I can, I can imagine my heart would be racing in that room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how does the technology side come into play? Sure. So as I was in college um, and, and I began to be excited by, and I was always really excited by technology in general, you know, whether that be video games or just technology's impact on our culture, and I wanted to tell stories about that. You know, I was always a person who watched every Apple keynote um, growing up, and I still do. That's like a <laughs> holiday in my iCal. Um, and so I just started to see how it could overlap in my work. And, and the key moment that inflected was um, one of the last project I worked on at Northwestern was a collaboration between the theater department and the engineering school and it was using Google Glass, right? And so this is when Google mm. Glass was pretty new um, and people were exploring the possibilities of performance with the actors in Google Glass. And what we were doing was um, creating a algorithm that would scrape uh, data from the internet and turn those um, words and data into a script for actors to be able to receive live while wearing the glass and then perform for a live audience. And so my job was to help the engineer essentially dramaturg this performance. Uh, and I was trying to essentially tell the story of like Romeo and Juliet, but with data from like Yahoo Answers and Reddit and all these other places. And so I had to say, okay, we need a sentence from a story about um, revenge. And then I need a sentence from a story about heartbreak, right? And I'm like breaking down Shakespeare's text into these ideas and then telling the AI, okay, how are we gonna turn that into something else, right? Mm. And I saw in that moment amongst other opportunities I had at Northwestern that making theater is more than just the basic performance. Uh, it's actually how artists are really powerful communicators and are really powerful just weavers of ideas and that we're really powerful translators and that I was essentially translating my skills into a technical skill for this engineer. And that is a special skill that I've in that moment was like, oh, that's really interesting. And I've learned then learned after 10 years, oh, like that's a very unique skill that I'm very good at and that a lot I've learned a lot of other people aren't necessarily good at. And so it's been a big part of my journey over the last 10 years. And so that work though, I think can be seen um, in the time after that. And so I continue to be interested in what would be possible using other headsets like glass and what's possible there. I was making other performances involving technology um, on my own and then was connected with um, an amazing artist named Lance Weiler, who works out of the Columbia University Digital Storytelling Lab. And he is very open and collaborative about his work. And he does a lot of work he calls essentially copy left, which is like creative commons practice where he invites people into the space. And he's like, this is a maker space. We're going to mash things up. We're going to make a big thing, but then you can go and do whatever you want with it on your own. And everyone can kind of share together. And I got to work with him on a project called Sherlock Holmes and the internet of things, where it was <laughs> my job to similarly write 
the script and thought tree for IBM Watt. We were using IBM Watson, the IBM AI, to help tell mm-hmm. a story. And I was in charge of figuring how that works. Um, and then that led to a experience called Frankenstein AI, uh, which was at Sundance in 2018. And that's where I was um, both helping with the producing of that and collaboration and then created a dance performance where the AI was essentially co-choreographing with me and manipulating the dance in real time in a live performance. And this is where kind of things kept getting deeper and deeper. And I discovered VR and AR while at Sundance in a more um, specific way because you get exposed to all the other projects that are there. And I said, I actually think like, I think I'll be really good at that. Like I think the skill set that makes uh, VR really powerful, I share. And I, I came out of that because of seeing a piece called Wolves in the Walls, which is made in collaboration with Third Rail Projects, which is an amazing immersive dance company that's based here in New York. And I was like, this is good because dancers made it. I, I think I can do that too. Um, and really from that point, then the rest is history. I went to a hackathon and it kind of just kept going and I just kept being brought into the community because the tech community and especially the extended reality community or XR, as we say for short, um, is actually quite welcoming. Um, and they were really excited to have an, um, someone with my background there. And this was a moment actually when I was pitching a lot of projects to theaters and the theaters were being very closed door and they were saying, oh, we don't, we don't do tech stuff here. Like that's out of our budget or that's out of the realm of what we do. I don't know. And I'm just like, I promise I'm an artist. Like I can take care of that stuff. Just let me have this residency, (laughs) you know, Uh, it's like, we can do it together. Um, And then the tech side at that moment was like, no, yeah, come on in, come on in. Um, And so I was able to really build relationships on that side and things have continued to build, but that's a long story short, too late, a little bit of how that all came together. It's interesting that you say that theaters are resistant to or companies have been resistant to embracing technology and even just like the basic of filming of shows is like there's this huge resistance in the industry. I mean, it's changing yeah. and the pandemic has changed a lot of that, but it's it's frustrating this this resistance to embracing like what is inevitable, I think. Um, but let's talk about a company that does embrace it, a musical mm-hmm. theater factory and your sure. work with um, MTF XR. Absolutely. So MTFXR all came together um, because I was uh, speaking at events and I was producing these experiences, merging together live performance and extended reality. And so for folks who are not super familiar with what that might look like, it could be you um, at home in a VR headset and you are experiencing a live performance with other people essentially as avatars in these fully 3D worlds um, and with other audience members all over the world, all joined together. Um, It could look like you in your home with a kind of experience playing out on your tabletop and you're holding up your iPad to it for it to come to life. These are all things that are real and are happening now. This isn't some distant future, this stuff exists. Um, And so uh, I was exploring that world and talking to a lot of theater companies about it. Um, while still being a uh, producer at MTF, uh, which I've been for, you know, about eight years at this point. And as we were having these conversations and everyone was like, it was kind of moving slowly. I turned to MTF and they were like, why don't we just build this program? (laughs) Like we're talking about me wanting to build an amazing possibilities of just giving better access for artists to explore this new genre um, because it can be really cost prohibitive um, and it can be really hard for artists just to get to try and have that experience without, you know, going straight to like, we know exactly what we're doing or I have all this extensive training. Well, you need to get there first, right? So I wanted to essentially try to give people the experience I was able to have over the course of four years by going to all these a million different events and kind of help walk other people through that. And MTF was on board and it really fit our mission of artist services and helping to reimagine the possibilities of what the 
uh, future of musical theater and the present of musical theater look like and deconstructing oppressive ideologies. And that fits into even the form of the musical itself um, and also providing access to BIPOC artists and trans artists and other queer artists. And so we were excited about um, making this happen. And uh, we've now been running our MTF XR Extended Reality Program for the past uh, three years. And we are amongst the first XR theater programs to be funded by the NEA in the country, which we're really proud of. And also shows that the NEA wants to support this type of work. Uh, and you know we've been able to work with them in a couple of different facets to help other organizations also begin to do it. And you're seeing um, Oregon Shakespeare Festival has a great program in this way as well. Um, mm -hmm. Actors Theater of Louisville is also doing phenomenal work. Um, and so we love to be amongst uh, those companies, especially as a company that's significantly smaller than both of those organizations. Yeah. And I have two questions. Um, what does a like a, a season look like for MTFXR? And um, what kind of musicals should be thinking about using this technology? Sure, two very good questions here. So first, um, MTF is an artist service organization. And so we are, um, even though, you know, it's, you know, things are moving due directions. We're not necessarily producers of musicals. Um, so we are here to help you find dramaturgical support, uh, find developmental support, um, you know, come in and we do a number of different elements that we call our assembly line. And so our season is these kind of different moments for our artists that move through to do our salons where it's kind of like this big party that happens once a month where there's a, a curated conversation and an open mic. And then we have our round tables, which are opportunities for artists to share work with each other um, in kind of a closed, safe environment um, split by uh, identity affiliation. And we also have one that's for everyone, intersectional round table to come together. And that's one that I'm supporting and one that Louisa came to uh, just the other day. Um, and <laughs> so... We have these different types of events and moments where we also do deeper workshops for shows, et cetera, et cetera. And MTFXR lives across all of these things, right? Because we as an institution believe that we don't want XR to be this fun little thing in the corner, right? Where it's like, oh, and this is where the XR musicals hang out. We believe that this is the type of conversation that every artist should be having about the possibility for their show and like the greater you know, universe of what their show could be. Because many artists just assume, okay, I'm writing this musical, it wants to be in a proscenium, it's hopefully going to go to Broadway. But maybe not every idea wants that. I think maybe some ideas actually would be better served as a musical in virtual reality, right? Or, mm. you know, we have a pretty broad um, definition of what that means or what XR means. And so any sort of immersion is what we want to help folks with. And so I'm kind of like an in-house a uh, creative producer slash XR dramaturg. And I can meet with artists and I share um, just tools and things that I've learned with them to help just open their mind of the possibilities. And that's oftentimes just coming to people's houses or they're coming to the studio and we just like put a bunch of headsets on them and go, this exists, this exists. Oh, this exists. And then they go, oh, wait, that makes me think about this for this show and this for this show, right? Um, and then we're able to dig deeper into the possibilities for, what they want to do. So it's not like a typical season in terms of we're going to do this show, this show, and this show, but we're able to be pretty agile and fluid in our ability to serve our artists in the moment um, and then create some key opportunities for artists that have moved through MTF or have come to us. You know, there's an artist right now who we're working with who knows they want to use um, like some sort of hologram like technology in their live performance. And they mm -hmm. keep pitching that, but they've never actually done it. Um, and, <laughs> and they, and they say the producers are telling us go do that and then talk to us. But like, how is that person supposed to get funding for their musical before they talk to the producers? Right. And like doing this is really, it can be really expensive. So that's like the perfect place for us to come in and say, yeah, we're going to help 
curate this workshop for you. You're going to come to a studio for two days. You're going to have access to uh, your creative technologist that you want to work with. We're going to have the we're going to have the equipment, and you're going to decide. Okay, is this motion capture? Is this volumetric capture? What is this like actually in the show? Do you like this? Uh, maybe you don't. Uh, that's fine too. But you need the chance to try, just in the way you need the chance to write a new song for a show and maybe cut it. Um, so that sense of it being a tool and not the genre, I think, is something that is really important to us. In in these like kind of workshop and development stages and like play stages, how I can see how like the like choreography and movement like factors in because it's like a physical body and and how that plays with VR and um, XR, uh, AR rather. How does like music come into this world? Yes. So as you're saying, um, I believe that theater makers and specifically choreographers are so well primed to be the leaders of the XR space, because this is a spatial medium. And, you know, for a long time, a lot of folks were leaning on filmmakers because they're like, oh, it's a screen. It's just a natural transition. And the, the film community kind of adopted it very quickly. The theater community naturally pushed it away very quickly. But everyone's realizing us theater makers are actually the best at understanding how to do this because we understand moving people through space. And we also understand transitions, honestly. Like that's when I talk about like why musical theater makers specifically are the best is because musical theater makers are some of the best transition makers in the world. Uh, <laughs> and I believe that like transitions are what make good musicals and good shows. And so because of that, because you don't want to snap people between these different worlds, right? It wants to feel like a seamless immersive experience, like you're on a Disney ride, right? And musical theater makers are so damn good at that. And especially musicians, because they are the undercurrent, right? They are the underscoring of that. And a composer understands how to kind of bring you through with these kind of subliminal tools of different tones, of different chords throughout the show and throughout the experience to guide you along, right? Or to remind you of certain things with motifs, right? This is all stuff musicians have been doing forever. Uh, and it's that basic stuff that's needed now um, that a new industry is forming and trying to solve all these problems with new solutions when artists have, have been using the same solutions for thousands of years. We just need to be all talking to each other. Uh, yeah. And that's why I'm passionate about this and calling myself a translator and bridge builder because we, also, we both need each other uh, in this conversation. Um, and music, especially in VR, even, you know, VR video game makers always say like, it's the most underrated important part of a VR experience is the sound design because mm -hmm. we just as humans, even though it's so, it's a visual, such a visual intense visual medium, the sonic experience just instantly helps you understand space. It understand, helps you understand where to look, um, without having to use any language, right? It's like you drop mm -hmm. a sound behind someone, they're just, they're going to turn around because they're an animal. That's just how it works. <laughs> and that's amazing. And we get to use that um, to guide them through the experience. Oh, that's so exciting. And it's funny that you were saying like that in the early adoption of this, that people went to filmmakers. And I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about sound design in film and how like a really good um, film composer, you shouldn't be able to notice the music, but it makes you feel all the feelings. Exactly. And it's it's interesting how that translates into this VR world and mm -hmm. the importance of it in theater. And like, again, like you said, that crossover. Exactly right. Let's uh, I, well, let's move over to TikTok, uh, sure. where your videos are so, so much fun and have such a great energy to them. I am terrified of TikTok and so your <laughs> the way that you have embraced it is really really fun um I love that you have talked about um particularly Ratatouille the musical I love this quote the Ratatouille musical is the perfect example of the collaborative power of the internet and TikTok this shows what happens when you democratize the creative process and create access for people who typically don't have access to huge institutions and money could you talk us through a little bit more about that? Sure. So 
I also, you know, really love TikTok. I think it is such a powerful community building tool. Um, and it's been amazing to be a part of that community over the last uh, two years now. And it's afforded so many great opportunities. Um, and I've always been someone who was excited by the possibilities of social media, but could never find the right in for me and the right. I tried to be a vlogger for a little bit on YouTube and was like kind of deep in that land with some like famous vloggers. And it just never went anywhere because it just, I couldn't handle the long form editing, but on TikTok, <laughs> I love that I can just like speak to the phone and make it happen. Um, and I feel just so much more connected to the audience. And I think the core of that, right, is what also makes it such a powerful tool for uh, theater makers and for theater producers, because there is such an intimacy of TikTok, this, you know, feeling people always say when they're scrolling and writing in the comments, oh, this feels like a FaceTime call, right? Mm -hmm. And that level of intimacy in terms of just like how we are now bred and trained to experience our phones um, makes us feel naturally connected to that person or whatever we're watching. And they want to build that out. And audiences are asking us more and more to feel connected to the material uh, in order to then hopefully go on to support the show. Um, and I often say uh, we need to be treating our audiences like collaborators, not consumers. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons that uh, Ratatouille taught us that Bridgerton um, taught us and that other musicals such as uh, Epic right now, which is an amazing musical that is being kind of unfolded over on TikTok right now. And they're showing us that you can build these amazing communities if we let our audiences in. Uh, and it, that doesn't need to mean in the case of Ratatouille that we're all co-authors, right? That was like the first kind of run of it but it can still be written by the writer, but you can just <laughs> open that process up and it feels like we're collaborating with you as well. Mm. Mm. Do you think, um, I, I, you've talked before on, on TikTok uh, about how um, like corporations have trouble with TikTok because it's like, you know, layering down through the marketing team and the PR and like mm -hmm. it, there's so many channels of people that have to approve it before it's allowed to go online and how their corporations aren't able to be responsive in that uh, in the way that TikTok needs to be. How do you think like like Broadway musicals or, or big, big names can can utilize TikTok to to engage audiences? For sure. Ultimately, you know, it is a challenge, you know, and I made videos talking about this because I think we need to name the challenge and then we can begin to talk about it and address it. Uh, and I think these challenges are being talked about, you know, in smaller Broadway circles and amongst those marketing teams. But I sense there's kind of a missed connection between all of the different sides. And I'm noticing, you know, based on some of the current climate on Broadway that the audience doesn't quite understand what's going on sometimes. And I think it's really important mm -hmm. we let them in and help them understand the bureaucracy because they are just lashing out and they're like, this is terrible. This is terrible. And I'm like, you can feel that way. And like, there are certain moments when I might agree with you, but I also want you as the audience member to understand like you can make a video and I, I can make a video on my account right now and post it within 30 seconds. That literally cannot happen for a Broadway show, right? And there's just so many layers of it. And so I believe we need to begin to break that down for the audience and we need to begin to really have those conversations in the rooms with the producers and with the unions um, and with um, all the stakeholders and say, okay, like I think we all want the same thing here for the most part. Because um, there are, I know, certainly a lot of artists that are very skeptical of it and are scared of what it means to like enter into the room. And that's fair. And I totally get that. And that's why I love working with those artists because I say, hey, I'm an artist too. I'm with you. I'm not some random person coming down to tell you this is what you need to do. I'm here to help facilitate your vision into this other medium that I happen to be really good at and I know is going to make people fall in love with your amazing show. Mm -hmm. And so it ultimately comes down to that trust, right? We need to build the trust with the artist and not just tell them they need to do this. We want them to be on board with it. And then we need to 
build the trust of the room with the actors as well. And so my like ultimate vision of where I think this needs to go as an industry is a new understanding of a role where like I see myself, that's why I started a whole company really revolving around this. Like I see it as a bridge between marketing and creative. And I don't really just see it as marketing. I really see it as a creative role where someone like me would be in the rehearsal room on day one and they would have met the team far in advance. Um, and ideally I had been, I'd be working with you while you're developing the show for two years and I'm just there too. And like, I'm a part of your journey um, and we're able to share with people. And then when we arrive on the first day of rehearsal, all the contracts and all of the actors and everyone's on board because they signed up for this and said, this stuff's going to get filmed and we're going to show messy stuff. We're going to show it raw um, to the agreement that the room agreed on, right? That doesn't need to be what I think. It needs to be what we as a company have decided in advance mm -hmm. to do. I think a lot of the challenges is, right, and I, you know, in talking about trends and that Rockette video that went crazy viral recently <laughs> that I posted, <laughs> it's like, it's this rapid catch-up response, right? That That is so hard and Broadway just can't, can't do. It's not built mm -hmm. to work that way, right? It's just not. And so we need to go way back and say, let's set us up for success so we're not trying to pull some strings last minute to make something happen, you know? Yeah. And what do you think... Um like how with filming things and like, you know, putting, making things available online and capturing like all this content, how we keep, and you're talking about like, you know, having these agreements in place beforehand and having conversations with people, keeping the room safe that people feel like able to experiment and like fail in the rehearsal room yeah. because it's, it's not public, but like this, this could change that kind of, um, that model, I guess. Yeah. I think that, it, it's about just having that conversation, right? I think that everyone will feel very differently about it. You know, I'm someone who like was vlogging my rehearsals five years ago, right? So I naturally feel very comfortable with it. Um, and then I had to have a conversation with the dancers I brought in of like, this is what I'll be doing. Like, let's make sure you're comfortable with it. I'm not going to just do it and then tell you afterwards, right? Um, but I think that if we have those conversations, we're able to get everyone on the beginning of the same page. And I think there's this, there is a subtle line that often gets conflated of like, oh, we're sharing. And so it's now no longer safe, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the, middle, the immediate place everyone goes to. It's like, you're ruining our safe space. And what my counter to that is you can mess up. You can change things as much as you want. And that's okay. And that is actually a, that's the big jump for most artists that they, they truly don't understand, right? Because they're mm -hmm. like, it's so precious. It's so precious. And it's understood because the way the theatrical model has lived, especially the commercial theater model is we're making this musical for six years. We need to chisel away at it and perfect it and not show anyone to it until we think it's perfect. And we're going to send it to these far off cities so that they can't possibly tell New York what it is, right? And like, we're still living in this world where like people don't talk to each other in different cities, right? It's like, the, it's the same model. that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so we're trying to work in this model of like out of town tryouts, secrets, when actually the way the world works is the more you share, the better, right? Like every other trend and in industry is telling us that. So as long as you do it like smartly, right? So that's where I'm trying to help people have the nuanced conversation is, yeah, release the album. If it changes before it gets to go to Broadway, your fans will be so, they're like, I have the exclusive early track. They'll think it's cool, right? Like exactly. they won't be like <laughs> mad about it, but, but truly the majority of, of like producers I talk to, like they would not agree with that. So mm -hmm. that's where we need to, and I'm like, that's where I'm trying to help the conversation um, but that's also where I think the most productive conversations are happening when we're like flipping this paradigm of like sharing doesn't mean unsafe, you know? Yeah. It reminds me of like 
back in the 90s when DVDs were a big thing and uh, you could watch blooper reels of films and, and whatnot. Yes. And like how fun that was for audiences and how, and like you're saying, audiences love being able to see like the changes and why it changes and the like they love mistakes. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's finding it's finding the balance, right? I think there's, I'm not saying like big brother style, like stream the room 24 <laughs> hours a day, right? I like, there's definitely some conversations that we need to be having in rooms that need to be private for them to be productive. A hundred thousand percent. We're very clear about that. But if we, in the beginning of the process, say like Brandon comes on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to rehearsal with his phone, like that just allows us to know Brandon's going to be filming on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And like, then, yeah, we might just be like, great, we're going to choreograph this number on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And like, we can facilitate that process, you know, and we can find the stuff that's live. And then we, and then also the director, the choreographer, or the actor go, please don't use that. And then I go, okay, no problem. Right. That's like, right. It's just that we live in a world where like that is scary because everyone thinks they're trying to like use each other a little bit, honestly. Mm -hmm. Right. Or like, mm -hmm. Oh, if you don't give me this TikTok today, we're going to like, I, when do I come back? Because the scheduling was so complicated. Right. But if it's just more steady, it's like, yeah, that's fine. I'll just cut that out. No big deal. And like, you don't have to be scared of me. And I can also ask you for something. Right. Um, and so it doesn't just, it's not like, I think people imagine like everything you say will be used against you. And it's like, no, it doesn't need, it doesn't need to be like that. No, exactly. What's your sense of where we're at with equity contracts and filming live theater? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn because I'm definitely not, I'm not a member of equity and I'm not in those negotiations. All I do know, and I literally just posted a video about this today um <laughs> it is that uh about three weeks ago it's the end of 2022 um the broadway negotiations for equity were just approved and to my knowledge there was no update to any of the stuff we're talking about in regards mm -hmm. to social media rules or streaming um and these contracts are in place for three years so on face, I can say that to me is disappointing. They made some great strides in a lot of other really pressing issues around 10 out of 12s um, and kind of like worker safety, which I totally understand as higher priorities. Um, and I think, you know, maybe there's possibilities for some of this stuff to get figured out on the side um, and smaller, you know, groups can experiment with it, you know, and there always is opportunity for a producer to go to the union and request something right it's not like a oh right where no one's allowed to talk to each other for three years right that happens all <laughs> all the time you know when when we um you know i joined the k-pop tiktok team towards the end of the run and we had the live stream and so when we put that together you know they approached all the unions and said hey we want to do it and we were able to make that happen very quickly right so there's a lot of possibility there um uh my sense is that and I take this a little bit from uh, being at Broadway Con this year. Uh, mm -hmm. Something we were there was this really amazing panel about recording theater and streaming theater, and there were a lot of really amazing folks from like different Broadway streaming HD, companies, Hello. Broadway HD, exactly, all talking. Mm -hmm. um, yep, and as well as some writers who were collaborating. But then towards the end, they said. I don't think this is going to happen until Disney does it. And then when Disney does it, it'll be okay. And that really pissed me off, to be honest, mm. because mm. I was, I was just like, why figure it out? Like I get, like, I get that. Cause that's saying we know what's going to happen, but we're going to wait for someone else to do it. And I get where they're coming from, right? They're coming from this sense of, Disney has the power, which I totally, right? They have the power and they have the money to do something that could lose millions of dollars and it's no big deal, right? All of that makes complete sense to me. I don't pretend to be, you know, I understand the business side um, as much as I can. But I do think we need to like sit at tables and just solve it be, mm -hmm. and not just like wait for a miraculous other person to solve it. 
Um, you know, and there may be conversations happening that I'm not privy to. I'm, I'm certain there are conversations happening that I'm not privy to. And there are lots of shows that are leading the way in this regard. Um, and it doesn't need to just be Broadway, you know, shows like Circle Jerk with the company Fake Friends and work that Jeremy O'Harris is leading. People are, um, and Jared McCosey is a really huge proponent of this work. Um, and so it's, it, the conversations are happening. We're knocking on the door, but I'm just waiting for someone to get in the room and then not leave the room until it's solved, you know? And it's, it's frustrating that like people at that level are talking about like, let's wait for Disney because I, this is something I've talked about a lot with um, Paul Gordon, the composer who had Daddy Long, Daddy Long Legs uh, was yep. the first off-Broadway musical to be streamed. And he is incredibly uh, passionate about making sure that the commercial entities, um, conglomerates do not become the leaders in this because what happened with music streaming was that when Spotify and Apple took over streaming, the artists completely lost out. And that's what could happen with filmed theater too. If the, like if like the Netflixes and the Amazons and the Audibles, like if they become the the people yeah. driving film theater, it's like the artists will lose out. Right. It's, it's very possible. You know, I, I thought in the heights of COVID, I, my big prediction was that Netflix or I thought Amazon, because this was when they were maybe thinking of moving the Amazon campus to New York. I was confident that Amazon or Netflix was going to buy a Broadway theater and they were going to mm -hmm. like rig it out and they were going to like completely turn the industry upside down and be like, this is what we do here. And I was, to be honest, a little excited about it at that time <laughs> because I was like, even though I wanted it to be maybe like Apple or something, um, but because I was like, someone freaking do something, you know, like let's like, yeah, shake people up a little bit, you know, why not? And like the unions would have like had to fight back and they wouldn't have allowed certain things to happen. So I like believe the balance, you know, would have been all bad, but right. That's just another example of, you know, waiting for this kind of large entity to kind of have their way, which is not necessarily actually what we all want, right? Like <laughs> the people in these union negotiations, you know, you know, I want to believe have the best spirit of the form in their heart, right? And so it's just a matter of finding everyone's come together. And I've heard both from the actors and from the producers, I've heard both sides to me go, it's the other side. We believe we want to do it. It's the other side. I'm like, okay, uh-huh. So I, I, that's, that's a good starting point. Um, and then it goes obviously much deeper when we start to talk about live versus filmed and streamed, right? Like these are all different things that often get mashed together, which, you know, you know very well. And that's what's great about the conversations you're hosting. Um, because especially on TikTok, people are like, they just use the word pro shot to mean like anything on film of a show. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> there's just so many different rules that you're activating in one question that people don't fully understand. And I attempt to be nuanced on TikTok, which <laughs> you know, it's not the, what the medium wants, but that's what I'm trying to do there to be like, actually, like this union is preventing this from happening. Um, and this union is actually preventing that from happening. And this is not even a union problem. It just is literally never going to be profitable in this model. It makes no sense. Right. And you need to have, it's a business. Like, why would you make this choice as a producer if it's not going to make you money? And I like, agree with that. That's a huge other whole other thing that people really are ignoring and all this, which I think really needs to not be ignored, you know? Mm. I, you were reminding me of like every now and then on Twitter, there's a dust stuff about release the archives, release the New York Public Library archives. And it's like, oh, you don't know the red tape that that would involve. Like, it's just, yeah. it's, it's just like the, the amount of work and not, not that we shouldn't do it because it's a great amount of work, but like the legalities and the the bureaucracy bureaucracy behind it is that's what makes it complicated. Yes, and and I will say you know there there is amidst all this there is hope right because I think there are other people <laughs> like us who are passionate about it. The audience is getting louder than ever about it, and you are seeing shows share a lot more in the past two years than they've ever shared. The amount of footage coming out of Hades Town, right, is is astounding. Wicked is showing Idina from like 15 <laughs> years ago, right? This past week, I was like, this is amazing, right? So the shows are real. 
people are realizing it. Um, and I think because of the market that we're currently in, in January, 2023, um, and a lot of shows closing, um, a lot of shows struggling while other shows make massive amounts of money. Um, I think everyone's beginning to be a lot more open to, Hey, I think we could start to try some new things or at least go, okay, well, this works here and this works here. And this is how this can fit together this way. Um, and my hope is that I'm helping people flip their mentality of seeing some of the things I'm proposing as this new risk. And my proposal is, I actually think the way you're currently doing it is more of a risk than trying what I'm suggesting, because what you're showing isn't working um, mm -hmm. consistently anymore. Um, and like, I think it's actually a bigger risk in some ways, you know, there's something like, I'm not mm -hmm. saying the whole model is broken in, in any way. There's lots of very, you know, shows that do fantastic, but I do think it is a l bigger risk to open a new music, original new musical without a lot of new audience community building tactics than it is to spend the money for two years and like cultivate an audience. Like I genuinely mm -hmm. think that is a less risky thing to do. Um, but that takes time, uh, right? And so we're not going to see the effects today, right? Like there's going to like suddenly an example of that. Um, you know, even if I want to attempt to do that with certain shows in their TikTok accounts, which I do, um, you're going to see it when Epic, right? As a great example, you're going to see it when Epic is a massive phenomenon in mm -hmm. three years. Then you're gonna go. Oh, this worked, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so it, we we have to have a little bit of that patience. Mm. Oh, I, that's a beautiful note to finish on thinking about the future. So before we wrap up, uh, we have uh, the final segment, my favorite things, where I ask you my favorite questions. These are a few of my favorite things. To start us off, what is your favorite musical? Impossible question, because I always say to people. <laughs> Is it that I was in, that I want to make, that I directed, but I'll, today I'll throw out Parade. Oh, lovely. That was recently on at City Center. Yes. And will hopefully be on Broadway soon. Very nice. Uh, do you have a favorite filmed live musical? Oh, a favorite filmed live musical. That's a really good question. I think, um, you know, I'm going to go, like, I'm going to go with the new Come From Away musical i think they did a phenomenal job with that one of my favorites just glorious absolutely glorious uh a filmed live musical is not quite a state sorry a filmed live musical is not a stage show and it's not exactly a movie so what should we call it i think we can call it a honestly i think filmed live musical makes a lot of sense i think you're on the right <laughs> thank you i think you're on the right track that's just what it is you know um it's a filmed live musical so i think that's the best that i've heard to be honest why thank you i <laughs> uh where do you stand on bootlegs uh yes so mm -hmm. i think that um ultimately I used to be really intense about illegal recordings. Um, and I actually have a pretty strong rule on my TikTok where I do these like choreography breakdowns where I show clips from shows where I don't ever use a clip that I can tell was illegally recorded. I try to always use mm -hmm. Tony performances or something that the show itself released. Mm -hmm. um, but I ultimately at this point come to a place where if your show is not taking steps to invite your audience into experiencing it digitally, I think you're only welcoming your slime tutorial on illegal recordings. Um, and so while I don't support them, I do think that if you're not doing anything about it, there's a little bit of a, mm, well, you know, this is happening. Yeah. That's right. So it's more of a, I see the, the recording as less, I see it more of as a symptom of the problem as opposed to the problem itself. Mm. Oh, that's a great answer. What stage musicals do you wish had been filmed? Oh man. I think that mm -hmm. makes me think I, next to no, that original production of next to normal, I think is just so unbelievably stunning. Um, I don't know if they've filmed a strange loop or not. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope they, I don't, I don't think they did, but 
Um, I hope that they have something that, because that's a show that is just truly one of the best musicals in the last 20 years um, yep. and needs to be seen by as many people as possible. Um, and I think would actually potentially film very well um, mm. uh, in a kind of come from away way. Um, <laughs> and um, what else comes to mind? I don't know. I think those are, those are some of the things top of mind. Great. I totally agree with you on a strange loop. I, I, with the, the caliber of the producers that are involved, I we would think that it was like, that's a lot of people who know a lot about film. Right. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what would, what musicals would you like to see filmed in the future? So that are like currently running, you think? Or any like, yeah, currently running or, or what future ideal. Yeah. I, I, I think the future ideal, honestly, is that essentially every show gets filmed. And I think we are actually moving um, genuinely in a direction where that's going to be normal. Um, you know, I've had conversations with folks where we're just hitting this kind of rocky middle point where it, it's it's expensive to do, right? It costs, you know, about a million or so dollars to produce one of these, you know, filmed quote unquote pro shots, right? Um, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a big production. And to raise a million dollars to do it while your show is like about to close when everyone's like, film the show, film the show. It's really hard, right? Because economically you can understand, like it's not a good investment to do that, right? Because like, where's that million dollars? Where, where are you going to make your money back, right? Mm -hmm. But I think where we're shifting now is producers just saying, there's an additional million dollars we need to raise at the, at the beginning in our capitalization. And it just is earmarked for the recording. And that's just what we do now. Um, and coming out of some conversations that I had with folks worked on Girl from the North Country, um, who they did film the show, um, and I've heard it's spectacular on film, so I'm excited for them and for that. When are they releasing um, it? <laughs> I have no idea, right? If they, it's been so long. It's been so There's long. There's a long list of shows that have been filmed, like Waitress and Aladdin and Girl yeah. from the North Country, Six. Come on, people. <laughs> we have We're no waiting. idea. Maybe there's this like magical new service that's going to like unfurl. They're all waiting. To it's a, <laughs> right. They could have all be waiting to something together. Right. That we just aren't aware of. Right. So um, I, I think that, you know, in conversations with folks who worked on that, they were like, yeah, we're just realizing this is just a part of the gig now. And I was like, that's really cool. Like, I'm really glad to hear a producer say that. Um, and so I'm hopeful that we're going to just see all of the shows do it and they're going to figure out a way to do that with the unions and make everyone more money because I genuinely believe it's not going to take away from the in-person audience at all. Not at all. And when those shows go on the road and people have had their watched it at home and they're desperate to see it in person, they're like those shows only benefit and that we have data for that already, like Legally Blonde and um, Phantom and Hairspray, like all of those yeah. shows that have had, and even a movie does the same thing, but that's a whole other thing. Yeah. And so uh, don't wait till the show's like never coming back to do it. Like, it's like, no, yeah. it's like, it should be a tool in your marketing to like continue the momentum of your, your world of your show so that there can be multiple experiences. And that also made me remind uh, one of my favorites as well, Passing Strange. I want to make sure we give a shout out to Passing oh, Strange. Yes. Oh, that's a great one too. Mm -hmm. Final question. Where can we find you online? Sure. So um, you can find me in many different places with many different usernames. So uh, <laughs> get out your pencil. So uh, hmm. on Twitter, where I'm talking a lot about um, extended reality and theater and kind of all and TikTok and cultural stuff is what Twitter's for for me. And I'm uh, at BPOW tweets, like B-P-O-W tweets. On Instagram, um, I'm BPOW33. And then on TikTok, where we're doing breakdowns and talking more about this stuff in impassioned ways, it's um, Brandon underscore Powers. And those are the main places you can find me. Wonderful. And we'll have links to all of that in the show notes. Brandon, thank you so much for your time today. It's been so much fun chatting with you. Absolutely. No, thanks for having me. The Filmed Live Musicals podcast is created and edited by your host, Louisa Lyons. FilmedLiveMusicals.com is where musicals come home. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. 
Shout out and all the thank yous to our wonderful patrons, Geraldine Brewer, Belinda Broido, Elliot Charles, Rachel Esteban, Mercedes Esteban Lyons, Hannah Granerman, James T. Lane, Alison Matthews, David Negrin, David and Catherine Rabinowitz, Jesse Rabinowitz and Brenda Goodman, Joe Tillotson and Beck Twist. Patrons generously provide financial support to preserve the history of film stage musicals and contribute to the curation of one easy place to find them all. If you would like to support the site, receive early access to this very podcast and early access to site content, become a Filmed Live Musicals patron for as little as $3 a month. Visit filmedlivemusicals.com to learn more. If you like what you hear, please leave a review on Apple Music. It really helps get the word out about the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thanks for listening. Hey.